Good. Um, so sorry for not uh, being ready yet uh, last time, and uh, I uh, still can't say that I'm really very clear on how to express all of this, but I'll do my best and uh, uh, rely on your indulgence. So um, I'm talking about generalized linear models. Um, the example that we're that uh, this section starts with is um, talking about count data. The example is the number of bikers per hour. The count data, it's not, it's not quantitative data, it's not qualitative data, so neither linear regression nor the classification approaches that we've considered so far are applicable. Um, so um, they go through the, the exercise of trying to fit linear regression to this um, biker data set, uh, bike share data set. So, um, and they sort of say, initially it looks, you know, it looks like the results you get sort of make sense where you can see that, um, the, you know, as, as weather progressively wor worsens, the number of bikers will decrease, uh, so the, the coefficients are becoming negative um, with regards to the baseline, which is clear weather. Um, and also, if you look at the coefficients that are associated with um, months of the year or hours of the day, um, the, the sort of general pattern matches what you'd expect. So in winter, it's low and, and it's also high during peak commuting times. Um, but there's a major problem here that uh, the model is predicting negative numbers of bikers at times. So um, it's not, not exactly very uh, trustworthy or useful for this kind of data. Um, so, and, and there's another issue. So um, looking at the, um, the variance of the bikers. So it, it makes sense to think that when there's worse conditions, there are going to be fewer bikers, but there's also going to be um, less variation. On a good day, maybe you'll get a lot of people, maybe you won't get a lot of people, but on, on bad weather, you, you, it's more likely that you'll have, you know, consistently few people. Um, so they, by plotting this over the case of the hour, of the hour you can see that um, there's very little variation at the low times and a lot of variation at the high times. Um, this is a problem because this is now heteroscedasticity, which is a violation of the linear model assumptions where um, the linear model assumptions include an error term, which has, which is a mean zero error term with a constant variance. Um, again, they go through the exercise of transforming the, um, the number of bikers, um, doing a log transform to the number of bikers and improves the variance. But now this is a problem where it, it now can no longer take on the zero value. Um, and then also they, they make a point that log transformation can result in challenges in, in interpreting the value. So they say, you know, a one unit increase in such and such a parameter uh, well, um, uh, uh, input variable is associated with an increase in the mean of the log of the mean number of bikers by an amount, whatever it is. So it becomes a lot less in intuitive to try and interpret the, what the model is actually telling you if you went to the route of trying to log transform and then do a linear uh, regression. Um, so there, there's initial two problems that I've already mentioned. So it predicts negative numbers of bikers and also this heteroscedasticity. Um, but then um, another issue is that uh, we're talking about count data, which is an integer value, and by using linear regression, it's now becoming model. It's now being modeled by a continuous response variable. Um, and then they say, that in this case, a Poisson regression model provides a much more natural and elegant approach for this task. So they start out by introducing the Poisson regression. Um, so you can model count response data quite naturally using a Poisson distribution, where the formula is given here. Um, and in this case, the, uh, the lambda uh, represents both the expected mean, the expected value, which is the mean, and the variance of the response variable. Um, so here, y is, is equal to the expected val value, and it's also equal to, sorry, that was supposed to be lambda. Um, so then, uh, if y follows a Poisson distribution, then naturally the larger the mean value, the larger the variance. Uh, and I just put together a little um, de demonstration of this going from um, lambda one, two, three, and four. And you can see that the, um, as the, the mean increases, the variance uh, increases as well. Um, so the Poisson regression model, um, they, rather than, um, so rather than modeling a, a count response variable as a Poisson distribution with a fixed mean value, so like one of these mean values here, um, they would, they want, you want to be able to allow the mean to vary as a function of the, the covariance. Um, so they, so they, they say that they can model the mean value as the, the log, um, of a, of a function of the predictive variables and it becomes this linear, um, linear function. 
And taking the log ensures that the lambda value can only be non-negative values. Um, and then they say this is equivalent, which will be useful in the, in the, in the next equation. This is equivalent to representing the mean as this, um, as the, as this linear function raised to the exponent. Um, the, the calculation of lambda from here um, can now be used in the formula of the Poisson distribution, which allows for the maximum likely approach that was previously discussed in logistic re regression sections to be used in estimating these parameters, beta zero, beta one, up to the number of parameters they are. Um, and again, the Poisson distribution formula is, is this formula here. And the maximum likelihood um, equation, they multiply together the, the, um, the, the Poisson distribution, the calculation of the, the probability of um, why um, the, the predictor given these input variables. Um, and they say that, so the co coefficients that maximize this likelihood uh, that make the observed data as likely as possible are then chosen. Um, and interpreting the Poisson regression is so something to take into account. Um, an increase in a given parameter, a given input variable by one unit is associated with a change in the expected value of the response variable um, by a factor of the, the, the given parameter, uh, the given coefficient um, raised to uh, the exponent. Um, so here, for example, this was done, the, the Poisson regression model was uh, fit to the biker's data. And um, so the baseline is clear skies weather. And if you see um, the, in, in terms of cloudy or misty weather, the coefficient is, goes down to negative 0.08. And that's interpreted as saying that um, that's a change in mean bike usage by a factor of the exponent um, to negative 0.08, which is 0.923, which is saying it's, it's, it's changed by that factor. On average, there's only 92.3 as many people will use bikes when compared to when it's clear. Um, the advantages of Poisson regression, regression again, um, can we now implicitly assuming that the mean bike usage in a given hour is equal to the variance of the bike usage during that hour. So compare that to the linear regression where it was assuming a, a constant variance, which is not the case for count data. And then also um, there are no negative predictions, no negative counts uh, using the Poisson regression model. And then um, just a sort of, um, just a, um, a sort of uh, template for as talking about gener generalized linear models. So GLMs all follow the same recipe. They use a set of predictors um, to predict the response variable. Uh, and they model the response variable as coming from a particular distribution. So in the case of Poisson regression, they use the Poisson distribution. Um, and then the, in all cases, the, the well, most cases, the mean of the response is transformed via a link function so that the transformed mean is then a, a linear function of the predicted. So for example, with Poisson regression, they use log as the, the transformation of the mean and they get this linear function of the predictors. And um, I think I blew through that in no time and I've not attempted the labs, I'm afraid. Um, so yes, I'm going to crawl out of yeah, now. Short and sweet. Yeah. Uh, anyone have any comments, questions, anything, any anything to catch up on? Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I, well, I have not read the chapter, so maybe it is mentioned somewhere. But why cannot count data be treated as a numeric data, like a regular numeric data? Just because it cannot be a decimal number or? I guess so. Um, I mean, they, they were kind of talking in terms of, you know, 47.5 units of sales in the initial simple linear regression thing, but I think that was to, in terms of thousands of sales. So it was, um, um, which actually now yeah. makes me, which actually now makes me question why why that was cons not considered count data. I mean, uh, is there any discussion that says this could be rounded to the next number, so it doesn't matter if we use a regular linear regression? Because so, even count data, I guess it could be 
off by just one unit. I'm going to just jump in. So I do a lot of um, time series forecasting. So it's like technically count for my job. And we would use linear regression theoretically, but we just kind of round up. I mean, honestly, even in our commercial forecast, which is not even using stat models. So yeah, theoretically, you probably shouldn't be doing that. But in practice, everybody kind of, you know, rounds it up. It's just my limited experience. So maybe some of you guys have other experiences about, you know, best practices in your job. So maybe the problem is not so much about this integer values. I mean, that was, you know, problem three. The first two problems sound a bit more severe, severe then. So predicting negative numbers or um, being completely off in, in assuming that the variance is going to be constant throughout. In my world where I'm, I'm doing things like um, predicting um, like cell counts, where often the cell count is zero or sitting right around zero, we've got to use Poisson because it will very, very likely come back with negatives if you just do ordinary least squares regression and try and explain a negative cell count to a doctor, it doesn't go well. Um, and, the, and the other thing is, is like the, the variance. You, you know that you're, if your variance estimates are, are messed up um, because you're using regular regression, you know your p-values are messed up. And so again, enjoy explaining that to a doctor. It's just you, you, you get impossible things or you get things that are um, known to be wrong. But like Laura said, if, if you're, you're playing around with counts where the counts are huge, it probably doesn't matter, in my humble opinion. Okay, that gives me some idea. Maybe for low numbers, as you said, if the numbers are closer to zero, then you have a big problem. Yeah, and the log transformation thing that they suggest, that can be problematic too, because if you have any zeros in your data, obviously you can't do that. If you're if you're settled on using linear regression, right, you can't use Poisson for whatever reason, you can always add like 0.01, you know, and transform it. Um, I've tried that before. I mean, I won't bore you with the details of my job because some of it's pretty tedious, but yeah. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Yeah. So in the book, um, there's a bunch of examples. So what, the, what I've written is a, a site which has two columns. Here's how to do stuff in base R. Here's how to do stuff in tidy models. Mm -hmm. So as you'll soon discover, it's a lot more typing. But once you've typed it once, you can copy and paste. So <laughs> in the book, they load the data package here. I'm loading the data package. I'm also loading tidyverse to do data cleaning and piping and tidy models for modeling. Um, they show names, I do column names. Um, I use the skimmer package always for describing data. So rather than doing summary, if you do skimmer and skim, you get the numeric summaries plus these lovely little histograms. So you can you know, quickly tell if you've got skewed or, or um, bimodal, whatever data. They show plot in the book. Um, I use ggpairs. It's, um, you can see, you get a lot more information. So this is probably too small to read. Um, and I do not want to open this browser. So if you use um, ggpairs, you get um, the, the scatter plots, you get the densities, and you also get the correlations. So all in one place you get the information you need. Um, they show plot. I think everybody here has seen ggplot a lot. So here's the equivalent code in ggplot. Now our stuff gets interesting. So in, when they fit the model um, in the book, they do GLM. Here is your equation, specify the data. And in this case, the family is binomial because this is logistic. In, and this is like kind of comprehensible, but with tidy models, you unpack things and you specify an abstraction. So you say, I'm going to do logistic regression. 
okay, rather than family equals binomial. And then you say what engine to use. So like in the book, um, I'm using GLM. If you're a Bayesian, you can put, put in um, Stan here, or you can put in other um, engines to do the computations. So in Titan models, you specify a recipe. So you just, so here I'm going to be predicting this with these things in this data. Um, and then what's cool is you can take this recipe and say, come, okay, the next step is I'm gonna combine the recipe with the model. So the recipe here was a logistic model and then, sorry, the specification is a logistic model and then the recipe is here. I can swap out the logistic model with a neural net. I can swap out the logistic model with discriminant analysis. So I only change this and the workflow which combines them will still work. So specify the modeling you wanna do, specify the data, combine them in a workflow and then fit the model. What's changed since last time is this part. So before I was showing, so this fits the model um, on this data set. Then here I'm saying, take that result and I wanna extract out the results of using the analysis engine. It's weird, but it is what it is. After you've done this, you can, ex you can then process the results of using the engine. So you do summary on this thing rather than, rather than um, you know, summary on the model like in regular old base R. So this is the, the tidy models workflow. Again, it's a lot to type, but once you've done it once, you can just swap out the engine and get different results. Uh, they show in the book coefficients, um, you can use tidy, which I, th is that part of Broom? Somebody know? It's in the yeah. tidy models, yep. it's in Broom. So rather than getting the, the weird structured text output, you get a, a table which has a consistent syntax. So you can always do tidy on any kind of model results and you get back a table that's easy to work with, a tibble. So here I wanna take um, the estimates and the terms and glue them together. So here's the estimates, the betas, um, and the terms are just the labels. Here's the tidy version of it. Um, and then I can pull out different pieces. So I'll get, hopefully get this on the web so you don't have to sweat like trying to remember the details. Um, but big picture is there's side-by-side -side versions. Um, there's side-by-side -side versions of all the stuff. Um, really nice. That's, it's really helpful to see it that way. It's, it helps me a lot because <laughs> I've, I've been doing this for 20 some odd years <laughs> since the S days. And it's a completely different mindset. And it's, again, the first time trying to get the typing right is a bit of a nightmare. Anybody got questions, comments, thoughts, or anybody who's done, want to look at one of the particular models? What, one more little bit then, this one's kind of helpful. So up above, I fit a model um, with all of the predictors. Here, I'm changing the recipe to say, I wanna drop these predictors. So rather than going with, with the five lag variables in, vo in volume, I wanna reduce it just down to lag one and two. So I can take a recipe and update it, refit the model, extract the um, outcomes, then there is um, like in the in the book when you look at the lab you'll see like this okay and I look at this or, sorry this line I look at this and I don't know what that means until I think about it or you know what in the world is this doing you, know, you actually have to think with tidy models there's functions that give that are there to do all of the tasks. So like if I want a, a confusion matrix, 
I can do confusion matrix and it gives me the results. If I wanna calculate the accuracy, I don't have to think through the algebra. I can just call accuracy and it gives me back the accuracy. Or I think this one is the negative, yeah. This formula is actually the negative predictive value for the epidemiologists in the house. And rather than having to code it, you can just use the NPV um, formula. So tidy models, you get piles and piles of functions pre-built to give you back the results that you would normally want. Um, that's kind of a nice bonus. Um, you don't want to know what this is doing, <laughs> but um, in, in here, there's examples for you fit a model and then you just want to use the generic plot function like you used to do in base R. So I've worked out the code so that you can pull that out. Um, that's there. I'm trying to think what else is special in this. Um, the tidy models package is, is, does not support all of the packages that are in base R. So like in the book, um, they're using Naive Bayes using the E1071 package that's not built into tidy models yet. And so I've got explanations about that in here about why you get differences. And the answer is using a slightly different package. Um, K nearest neighbors turns out to be a serious pain um, to figure out because the book uses the class library and it's not supported in tidy models, KKNN is. So this KKNN is what I've always used. I didn't know about class. The difference turns out to be how it handles ties. So if you have two points which are equi equally far away and you're trying to find the K nearest neighbors, you end up, say you want the three closest neighbors and there's a tie on the closest neighbors, you end up with four nearest neighbors. And it turns out that the, the class package will randomly choose among the equally distant versions versus K, K, and N chooses the th first three of three. So it handles things different. So in the notes, I have information on why there's discrepancies between the book. Um, another powerful gotcha is tidy models. If you have a binary predictor, um, calls the first level the outcome. And if your outcome is no yes as an ordered factor, you end up predicting the no level. So if your outcome is has cancer, and you have a, a no yes, you end up predicting who does not have cancer. And so I, I give a, um, the, the, the tidy models, or sorry, the tidyverse code for swapping the levels so that you end up predicting the yes class. Um, and there's also a function, an option within almost all the modeling functions where you can say, actually the outcome is the second thing. And so again, that's all here. So it's probably not the best use of your time to hear me drone <laughs> on about this. But um, again, I'll get this posted one of these days. 